Now, where did I put it? Hmm. Ah, here it is. Welcome to the Toolbox, where my guests and I discuss the tools they use every day to manage life, trauma, and everything. It may not be applicable right now, but it's another tool for your toolbox. And I hope you enjoy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Tools for the Toolbox. I am Chance Burles, as you know, a.k.a. Big Bird. Uh, I have another outstanding episode for you all today. So we're going to dive right in with the same question I always ask. Who are you and what is your military background? Hey, man. Thanks for having me on, first of all. But uh, my name is Casey. Uh, I spent some time in 2nd Ranger Battalion from 08 to 12. And uh, after that, I spent a few years doing security contracting overseas for an uh, OGA client. Wicked. So you, you, you did four years in, five years in? Uh, four right. years active duty, yeah. Active duty, right on. And how long did you do the contracting stuff? Uh, about four years. Uh, I still yeah. do it stateside here and there, but I don't go overseas anymore. But I spent, right. uh, all in all, I've been to Afghanistan 10 times. Dang. Yeah. <laughs> just, just a couple here and there, you know, yeah, just stop it. Just it. It's a luxury place to kind of go hang out anyway, so I get it. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> what, uh, where, where did you, where'd you hang your hat when you were, when you're actually over there? Was it kind of all over the place or did you kind of go to the same place over and over again? Yeah, all over the place. I've been to Kabul several times, Kandahar. Kandahar's fun. Uh, Sh- Sharana. <laughs> Logar province mm-hmm. and uh, Salerno and uh, yeah, that's about it right there. Right and J- uh, Jalalabad too. Ah, uh, good old Jabad. Yeah, <laughs> I never made it over there. <laughs> we uh, it's actually a really cool base. I really liked yeah? it. Yeah. What do you, what, it was it, anyway. what was it that was cool about it? Uh, it was like, like a, there was a lot of old Russian shit left over. Ooh. That yeah, is cool. uh, what's, what's the other one uh, called? Chapman, too, for Coast. Mm. There's the uh, same thing. There's like a bunch of Russian tanks there and helicopters and airplanes that were left behind. It's pretty cool. It's kind of like a museum. Yeah. You know? that, that, yeah. It sounds neat. <laughs> I kind of want yeah. to go there now just to go take a look at it. But yeah. uh, so now, now that you're doing contract here, is it mostly personal security, close protection, that kind of stuff? Or now is it, it is. more like now it is? Yeah, beforehand? Now it is. Before- before it was uh, like when I was overseas, I was doing uh, static base protection for mm. certain intelligence agencies and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, basically, just man in the wall, you know. Right. So it was like we were like the third line of defense. Oh, okay. Just in case shit happens. So. <laughs> yeah, when things go absolutely south, call these guys right, up. Right. Right. Which never That's did awesome. happen. Yeah. By the way. <laughs> well, you know, the the funny thing is, is that. We always say a quiet day is a good day, yeah. but man, we will complain the whole way through that day all day. <laughs> Just like, oh God, why is no one shooting at me? Like, what the hell? Right, yeah. It, uh, what, what does everyone do when they're bored? They bitch, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there, there's that great line of uh, like uh, a soldier, soldier loves, or a soldier only hates two things, change and the way things are. Yep. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Exactly. Um, so what do you, what do you do now? You do a little bit of contracting here, but do you do anything else? What do you, uh, what keeps you busy? Um, I am currently enrolled in uh, college at Nevada State. I am mm-hmm. taking, I start my last class that I need to graduate with my bachelor's in psychology next week. So nice. this semester will be easy, just that one class for the next four mm-hmm. or five months, and then I'm done, and then I can move on to my master's. But uh, aside from that, um, I work for a heroic arts project which is an organization Mm -hmm. that sends veterans to Mexico and South America to participate in ayahuasca retreats. Nice. We've been shown to have like a 98 or 99% success rate of veterans going down there and coming back feeling completely rejuvenated. Mm -hmm. Um, I've done it twice myself. So, and I, you know, obviously we'll get into that, but uh, I can, you know, attest to you that it, it works. And uh, aside from that, I play guitar. I'm in a band, which I just got into last week, which is pretty cool. And yeah. um, skydiving, uh, motorcycles, anything to keep my heart pumping. You know? <laughs> All the fun stuff. I like it. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. That's wicked. Um, so you got out that you got out in twelve. So, what was your transition like? Was that like 
pretty simple because you were contracting or was I lost it? You. Oh. Oh no. no! There you go. Say that. Say that oh. again. I accidentally hit the Hey Siri button on my. Own. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, the uh, you got out in twelve. So yeah. I was wondering what the uh, what was your transition like? Was it simple because you had the contracting, or was it challenging still? Uh, so I didn't start contracting for about two years from the time I okay. got out. And uh, I tried to avoid it, honestly. I was like, no, I'm out of the military now. Like, I want to be out of it, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, it just wasn't working for me. And that's not to say that it's, you know, externally anyone's fault other than mine. You know, I was just, I, I, I wasn't ready for that. I thought I could mm -hmm. walk right into it because, like, I always saw myself in the military as, like, not really someone was a military person, but just like, I was good at my job, but I didn't enjoy being in the military and dealing with all this standard <laughs> bullshit, bureaucracy and garrison mm -hmm. stuff, you know? Um, so I thought, you know, like, oh, I'm not even a, I, I, at the time I was like, I don't need any of that, you know, like, but I got out and realized I did need some of that, you know? And uh, so I finally got to a point where I was like, fuck it, I don't know what else to do. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Friends of mine were doing it and were making great money, and I was like, I got to do this. So I just did it, and uh, it was nice. And I wish – it was nice because it was like having one foot in, one foot out mm. with a really nice paycheck. And yep. um, and uh, so it kind of kept me – allowed me to keep my edge, if you will, and yep. uh, also like have my freedom at the same time. Yeah. You know, because I go over there for three months, come home for a month, month and a half, go back over for two, three months. And it was, but it became, uh, after a while, it became this thing where, like, I was using it to escape because, like, shit would get too hard at home, you know, with relationships or family or whatever. And, like, I'm out, fuck this, I'm going back to work. Yeah. And uh, I noticed that pattern in er, er, all, most of the guys that were there. Just like, man, I'd rather be here than at home sometimes, you know, and that eventually became the case. Like I would have rather been there than at home. But then uh, in about 2017, I got introduced to psychedelics because things just still were not like feeling great for mm -hmm. me, you know? And uh, cause I, my, my tolerance for being over there was getting short, shorter. My tolerance for being at home was getting sh uh, shorter. And I was like, I, I don't even want to be there or here, you know, so but yeah. I got to be somewhere. And I was like, I don't know what to do. So someone introduced me to uh, mushrooms. And I had a really amazing first time experience off of uh, an eighth of an ounce. And which is like this, for those who don't know, 3.5 grams of an eighth of an ounce. It's about the standard uh, dosage for, for someone to actually get some real work done. And uh you know, it just kind of opened up this whole other part of my brain that I wasn't using. Mm -hmm. And I kept contracting at that time. And it made being over there easier. It made, you know, it gave me a healthier relationship with myself and the occupation and being at home. Then I eventually did, like, the more mushroom trips I did, the more, the less I wanted to be over there and do something more meaningful with my life. And it wasn't, I didn't have anything to do with being over there, but I was just like, I'm not doing anything here. Yeah. You know, like I'm just making good money and going home and blowing it all. Yeah. You know, so I was like, I need to do something meaningful. And then I got the motivation to get back into school, which I did. I came home and uh, enrolled back in school. And I was like, I knew I'm going to get my degree in psychology and find in the meantime, find some way to give back to the community and help them, you know, deal with this transition process that we're all yeah. struggling with because I felt like at the time I had a, I was like, you know, with this new expanded awareness of myself and my reality and my emotions and my thoughts and all these things, and I was just like, felt like I learned so much just by reflecting on it all, but I didn't have the ability to reflect without the psychedelics, you know, and like how yeah. you mentioned earlier, like everyone's got their tools. Like this was my tool that helped yeah. me open that window and go, Oh shit, this is what it's all like, you know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just this overall increased awareness of everything and like having a more, uh, 
have an, a, an understanding of what I should be doing with this information, yeah. you know, and, and that was to give back to the betting community by starting the combat coach and all that stuff and continue with my degree and eventually one day become a mental health counselor. So, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, man, that the transition is it's killer. I know guys that have, you know, they set themselves up pretty well mm-hmm. and, uh, they had a pretty clean transition. I know guys that, tried to set themselves up and had a, just a train wreck. <laughs> it's, it's really hit and miss. And depending on what you do and what you don't do and how this plays out and that there's a portion of luck to it. There, you know, who get, you get is case managers and all these things. Mm-hmm. Um, if you could go back and talk to yourself and be like, you know, 2012 Casey, like this is what you're going to need to do. What's the one thing that you would like, uh, you would tell, you would get your, how would you get yourself to listen first off? <laughs> and what would you tell yourself to make that transition smoother, a little bit easier? Just try, how would you do that? Uh, I wouldn't do anything because, no. and I say nothing because one, there was no, I was not listening to anybody. Like mm. I just wasn't going to, not even to myself. So I was like, yeah. there's no point in even trying to talk to that guy because, you know, like if I look at the last 10 years, and what it was like it wasn't until like four years ago that i started listening mm. myself and following more you know along the lines of what i knew was right for me and not what is something i should do because everyone else is doing it for whatever reason but uh i was just i wasn't listening i wanted i was struggling to want to be alive i was wounded in 2011 and you know that just kind of took a lot away a lot of life mm-hmm. out of me i think and i didn't give a shit to be honest like i just i didn't care i didn't want to listen to anybody i just wanted to live on a high at all the time to avoid negative feelings of darkness and all these things and so i mean if i could if if i could go back i would just i would just watch and be like you're gonna figure it out eventually yeah. you know like yeah. just you're gonna you have to go through this process because i can't stop you from going through this process you need to go through it Otherwise, you're yeah. never going to get to where future you is now. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. The uh, I think the most common answer I get to that question, because I ask everybody, is patience. Yeah. Just, just patience. Wait, just you'll you'll see it eventually. Just like yeah. let yourself go through it. Let yourself go through the feelings. I know for myself, when I transitioned out, man, I was I was in a very similar mode. I was just like angry, didn't want to do it. Like I had this concept that i was this is going to be actually i think more of it was more of the check in the box because i wanted to be in the army since i was little mm-hmm. and so when Same. i got out and i and i got uh this i got a medical release and uh so i was like okay check in the box but i'm, I'm like 32 like <laughs> i don't really uh now what do I, I was actually i was 30 my son had just been born and i was like now what mm-hmm. and just trying to like uh and and on top of it you know all the symptoms of ptsd and all of the issues that surround uh trying to get out of the military on it in it in and of itself because the military is a it's a machine and when you enter into that machine the the analogy i use a lot is it's like a train and everybody has a job on that train right and when the train is working and everyone's moving and you're always just like there's no time for anything else because you're constantly moving from job to job to job to job to job mm-hmm. and then when you get off that train that train's gone <laughs> and you're just standing there on the side of the road just like okay uh now what do we do yeah and it's and a hard go there's a specific mentality that's required to keep that train operating Mm -hmm. And the military is designed, I mean, at least in the United States, and probably you can say the same up there, but I know from from my own personal experience, it's designed, especially if you're in a combat MOS, you're designed to be desensitized. You're designed to keep the machine working, you know? Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people will say, yeah, but they don't prepare you for getting out. They don't prepare you for all these things. It's like you can't expect the military to prepare you for things that it's not prepared to do. It's not prepared to deal with the things that we have to deal with. Like that's not the military's problem, unfortunately. 
you know, if we have to be realistic and be honest with ourselves. Like that's our problem now. And it's, mm-hmm. and, and that's, while it's not the best <laughs> uh, resource for these problems, but that's what things like the VA are for, you know? Yep. And I know that, and I, I say that as lightly as possible for anyone that's American and listening, they're probably throwing their arms up right now. But I mean, that's the best we got other than ourselves, right? True. So, yep. but to, to a lot of people, the reason I mentioned that again is because people will blame the military for the problems that they're having now because it didn't prepare them for the exit. But it's not, you know, like it doesn't, it does, it wants you to stay. It doesn't want you to exit. So why would it prepare you for the exit? Yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, I was talking to uh, to Chad a couple of days ago, and um, we were both we were saying I've been saying this for years too. Was that you know the army has a boot camp to get you in right to teach you and indoctrinate you into what you're going to be doing, and it wouldn't take much to create an out camp and have it no. run by veterans, have it run through the VA, like have it uh, like someone like yourself that would have a master's in psychology or something eventually, right? Could sit contracted there and work contracted yeah. exactly and then but also you speak the language right you you are it you are that you are the guy and that way when guys come out they're talking to a brother they're talking to somebody that's been there who's going like oh yeah, yeah I, these are some of the issues you're going to get hit with right Just and that's my exact intention with everything i'm doing yeah. now is to have that set up you know it may not be government contracted but it is there it is available yeah you know so what? Well, let's let's dive into that. What would you what would you like to see? Like as you develop your program, what is you would what do you want to turn into? I think like that, that would be really cool to be <laughs> subcontracted for through the government to be like as as something to just like you know, and they don't have to house it in an office or whatever, but something for them to give to guys getting out. And say hey you know there's this option too like i don't know if that would happen though because it's not you know my ideas and modalities is not really particularly government sanctioned so (laughs) i don't know if that would happen but i mean i would like to at least be known enough to know for the people getting out to know that this practice exists you know just um but again, man, it's always that I and I know the the shitty thing is is I know the reality of the situation and no one's gonna seek help until they fucking absolutely want it or need it, and that could be years down the road, you know. So it's yep. like, and I know that because I did that, you know, mm-hmm. and I know other guys that do that. But uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, I would like to see me in that position though. That would be cool. That would be sweet. Uh, there's yeah. always that um, when you get mandated to go see somebody, right? You're gonna show up and be like whatever i'm here for the two hours that i need to be here and then i'm out like you're not there's no buy-in unless you actually want to be there and that's a that's a fine line i probably why they don't have something like that because they know a bunch of you know (laughs) a bunch of military guys getting out and just be like nope not doing this right and also there's the there's the human factor of just like that's fine because no one's gonna be helped until they want that fucking help you know, yeah. like you have to want it in order to change. And most people don't want it because they don't know they need it yet. They don't, don't know. You know, like the reason why I didn't go after it right away because I was like, I don't need this shit. I'll be fine. You know, yep. but then like bad thing after bad thing kept happening until eventually I was like, all right, well, I don't know what I'm doing. then. So <laughs> <laughs> Those rock I need to ones. seek advice from somebody who can tell me what to do because I have no clue. Oh. Those are those are hard spots, man. When you get to the point where you're just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I have yeah. no idea what I'm doing, and everything seems to be going wrong. Now what? And I, I know a lot of guys that just dig themselves into that hole. They're just like, Well, no, I'm just going to do it harder. I'm just going to do it harder and do it harder. Yeah. And then yeah. they're they're so deep in that hole that it's it's a cha- it's a real challenge to get out. They've eventually created so much resistance that they can't lift it off. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Add more, add more weight, add more right. weight. And then you can't lift it. Now you're like, well, now I'm stuck. That's like, the, <laughs> that's like, that's like the people in relationships who have a baby because they think it'll save their marriage, you know? <laughs> yes, exactly. Just yeah. Weight. Just, you know, you yeah. need a uh, famous punk rock singer, Henry Rollins, you know, one of his big things is always like, keep your existence lean. Yeah. 
you know, and I always That's thought that, that was really profound, you know, mm-hmm. um, especially if you don't have, if you're not strong enough, since we're talking about weights here, if you're not strong enough to to lift the weight or to carry the weight, don't add more. You know, like that's not how you build muscle. That's not how you build strength. You don't add more weight than you can lift. Yep. You find a balance of a weight that you know you can lift for a certain amount of times, and then the next week add more. Yep. You know, it doesn't have to be a week to week, but you know what I mean. No, for sure, and it's the same with it's the same as physically as it is mentally as it is emotionally, right? It is you take what you can manage, and then you add a little bit more, and you see if you can manage that, and then. If you can add a little bit more and you have to, right. I, I had this issue when I first got out and not when I first got out, probably a couple of years after I got out when I was like, you know, I probably need to go back to the gym. My, my jeans were getting a little tight and you know, my shirts weren't <laughs> quite fitting the way they were supposed to. And, uh, it's like, I need to go back to the gym. So I started lifting the way I used to just right off the bat, no build up, no nothing. And I immediately hurt myself. Like it was just. It was too much, too fast, too crazy. And I got a, you know, I got my back is destroyed. My knees are toast and all these other injuries. But the, um, the lesson that I had to pull out of that was just like, I'm, I'm li- trying to lift with my ego. I'm trying to still be that guy. And how synonymous and, is that with reality? <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like how, how synonymous is that? Because like if you if you're if you're acting that way in the gym, you're probably acting that way out of the gym. A hundred percent. And that's it, man. It, if you try to lift with your ego, you will lose over and over and over again until you actually let that go, until you put it down. Mm-hmm. <sighs> you're gonna keep doing it. It's like it's just this, this never ending cycle of just like uh attempt and fail and attempt and then you get those people same thing just we're gonna do it harder we're gonna make it harder <laughs> like, make it yeah. harder key phrase yeah. right there i'm gonna make it exactly. harder make it harder yeah it's kind of crazy so let's uh let's talk psychedelics so my my actual uh <laughs> i got a kind of a funny story about my about psychedelics but i did some mushrooms back in the day before i was in the army uh back when it was still illegal and uh, it was, you know, you had to keep secret and hidden and stuff. And I did a couple of trips and uh, they were fun. I found that the big thing that I found with them was that it, it enhanced who you were at, a, at your core already. And so for a lot of the guys who were super chill, relaxed, happy, go lucky kind of people, when we took mushrooms, it turned into this really great positive experience where we were rolling around like, oh, that's awesome. And, you know, it's this kind of uplifting group effort i had a friend of mine who uh he's a really neurotic guy he was very down on himself constantly always really hypercritical that kind of person and he kept saying he's like man i really want to come out with you guys you guys make it look like it's so much fun and i want to try it one day and i was like maybe like i could i could introduce you to some other things that might help uh kind of in that realm but i don't think it's a great idea for you and uh, and he's like, but if you do, I'll, I'll hang out with you and I'll be with you and I'll just, I'll stay sober and kind of keep you in line. Babysit. And, uh, <laughs> he did not like that and decided to jump in with a, a different group of dudes. And man, he had a really, really bad day. <laughs> he came out of that and he was like, I have never, ever, ever going near that again. And how dare you let me do these things? Blah, blah, blah. And he laid, tried to lay it into me, but, um, past that, that, that was a whole experience of itself. But, um, but I did it a few more times and had some good experiences and I never really did any deep thinking with it. Mm-hmm. It was just more of an enjoyable recreational thing. Um, the kind of funny story about it was when I went to join the army, we have to do a substance use form. And so you write in all the stuff that you have to do and blah, blah, blah. blah. And I thought that, you know, I'm probably going to walk out of here and get a piss test right away. So I was absolutely honest except I couldn't remember how long it had been since I'd done some mushrooms. So I just kind of guessed and said, yeah, it's somewhere around like 18 months. Yeah, that'll be fine. Well, you know, you can't test for them, right? At the time I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, so I had into the form and they were like, yeah, sorry, we can't uh, admit you into the forces at the moment. You need at least three years separation from any sort of psychedelic drugs. And I was like super bummed out and I was like, dang. But then I was like, you know what? Fine. I'll be back in 18 months. And so it actually worked in my benefit because I got an extra year and a half to train and, you know, get 
better prepared. Yeah. Uh, and then I, sh- I showed up in disguise, huh? A hundred percent was. Um, so I showed up a year and a half later with my, all my package and boom, like, all right, let's do this. I'm here. I told you 18 months, I will be here. And they looked at me and they're like, I don't know who you are because everybody <laughs> no posted out <laughs> totally new crew people. <laughs> and, uh, but that's, that was, that was it. That was my only real experience with, uh, psychedelics was very, you know, hit and miss, very recreational. So how, how do we actually use it? How is, you know, uh, psilocybin and, uh, people are using MDMA now too, in some therapies and, um, ayahuasca and DMT and all these things, but like, how does it actually work to your own benefit? Uh, it has to start with the reason why, like if you're using mushrooms or LSD as a means to replace something like alcohol or any other, you know, uh, suboptimal uh, substance, then Mm -hmm. you're not using them properly. Like psychedelics, I think first and foremost need to be understood as being that they are tools. They -hmm. are not recreational fun things. And like, I know some people are going to argue with me or maybe have an issue with that and say, well, I've had great times at parties on mushrooms. Like I'm sure you have, but I think the ratio of people who have had, good times versus bad times using them recreationally is probably a lot higher on the bad end. And, Mm -hmm. but to have to use psychedelics, you want to use them because you're trying to understand something about yourself that you don't understand yet, or get some further, get some more meaningful clarification on some things. And like, for me, the first time I used them, it was like, I know that I'm not in a good place. And I don't know what a good place feels like, and I don't know how to get there. And I felt I when I had the, that first trip, I felt all those things, and I was exposed to this alternative way of thinking and looking and perceiving my reality than I had before. I understood why the people I had problems with were the way they were. I understood how everything is connected, like how we just talked about, you know, like the correlation between how a person acts in one uh, environment is probably congruent with how they act in other environments. Like that, those Mm -hmm. types of connections and understandings is what I was able to make. Like, oh, okay, I'm acting, if I represent myself in this way around this person or in this group or in this environment, then I'm probably doing it in other areas too. And I don't like that, or I do like that or whatever. And each trip gave me a more broader horizon of that awareness of myself and of, you know, the things that I see on a daily basis or the people that I know that are in my life. And it just helped me uh, over time release a lot of tension and anger and emotion really at all Mm -hmm. involved in any of these relationships I had with anything, including myself and all these other people. And that's what it's been for me every time I've had psychedelics, whether it be MDMA, mushrooms, or ayahuasca. Like the, it's all at the end of the day, the end result is an increased awareness of yourself mm-hmm. and your reality. Hmm. And w- with that comes tools to be able to release your grip on what you want reality to be. And let it, letting go and let it be what it is. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of, and especially in the military world, the veterans, like, we're designed and trained to take control. And in the real world, you can't do that. Like, there's nothing to take control of other than yourself. You, that's all you have. That's all you can control is yourself. And that was like, and we've all heard that phrase a million times. We've seen it on a thousand Instagram posts. Like, the only thing you have control over is yourself. But to really understand that concept, is a really large amount of weight lifted off of one's shoulders because now and it's so silly because you go oh i don't have i can't tell this person to be what i want them to be i can't tell i can't force people or situations to be what i want them to be it all matters in how i look at it or don't look at it so yeah no that's a 
that's it. That's, that's, that's outstanding. The uh, it really seems like it's a it's a facilitation of insight. Yes, right? it just it really allows you to see what is actually happening. <laughs> you know, when you mentioned control, that was a that was a huge issue for me. Uh, being a combat engineer, man, everything was about control. I got to control my environment. I got to control what I'm wearing. I got to control the people around me. I got to control the ground. I got to control the you know the metal sector. I got like it. Everything is. I the more I can control, the safer we can be. Yeah. And yeah, when I got out, man, it was, that's exactly what it was. It was all control. I just tried to control this and I tried to control that. And I tried to tell my wife, this is the way I needed things done. And that my, my kids needed to do these things in order to be like, everything was about what they were doing. And, it and in reality, until... what that is, all that is, 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 is a response to fear. Yeah. Like what we're afraid of most, we want to control something in order to mitigate a possible outcome that is fueled or that 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 fear surrounds mm -hmm. so it's like and guys don't want to admit this but you know like guys like that and i like speaking for myself like even today like nowadays i still run into that these fears that i have and these insecurities that i have and i want to control something so that they don't happen or that they don't come to fruition or whatever mm -hmm. and i have to realize that like there is no controlling it like whatever, it's like something. I'm a big Alan Watts fan. I don't mm -hmm. know if you know who that is. A British yep. guy turned Eastern philosopher, brought to the Western world. But he used to say that. Uh, damn it! What was I going to say? <laughs> <laughs> basically, that. Basically, what I just said is that we yeah. don't have control over anything other than ourselves. Yeah. You know. Oh, he said, uh, "There's no point." And worrying about anything that you worry about happening in the future because it hasn't happened yet. It's an illusion. You don't know what's going to happen. Moreover, it's going to happen anyway, whether you're afraid of it or not. So you might as well just chill and let it happen. You know, yep. paraphrasing, obviously. But that's what the gist of his, his lesson was. It's just like you don't have any control over it. All you can do is control yourself when it happens. Yeah, I think, it, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, you know, when we're, when we're training – everything's about control it's right. all about prepare control, for everything right? prepare yeah. for everything or like as much as you possibly can be ready for it because it'll happen and mm -hmm. we you know you go through your career going okay yeah i'm ready for everything i'm ready for everything i'm ready for everything but what i what i see a lot at least in the the regular army uh, not so much in special forces because they kind of like special operations train for this whereas i think the reg force doesn't in that we don't re we always get told adapt and overcome right adapt and overcome adapt and overcome but we're never really trained on it mm -hmm. where i find a lot of special operations they tr like they'll just throw in random situations this happens now what this happens yeah. now what this happens now it's so you're constantly like oh okay well i'll just i don't know move to here and oh that happened okay now so you kind of get used to the it allows you to remove that portion of uh Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! It's just yeah, it's already right. ingrained in your head. Like if you incur that situation, you already know what to do. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I think it's it's something that we need to practice more. That's one of the things I love about jujitsu is that it that it puts you in those situations where oh yeah, random stuff happens. Sometimes you just get kneed in the face, and you're just like, "What? That what?" But you're still rolling, <laughs> yeah. right? So it. Uh, that it just really made me think of a time I took an elbow to my eye right here last year and <laughs> cut my eye open. Uh, <laughs> that's no fun. I uh, yeah. I don't know how many injuries I have to like my fingers and my freaking wrists and all stuff just getting caught in a gi or getting thrown and landing weird or just yeah they're the no it's fun but it hurts. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now, um, was it you've done ayahuasca twice? You said yeah. you've done mushrooms, I imagine, a number of times now. Mm -hmm. um, what was the difference? Like, did you find a discernible difference between the two? Was one more uh, intense than the other? Or, like, how did that break yeah. out? Yeah. Uh, they're very different. Uh, it's the same in the sense that you're in the psychedelic space. So it feels familiar to that extent, like being okay. out of your mind, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, Oh, that feeling is very similar, but the trips themselves are very different. Um, ayahuasca is a slow onset of the chemical compound dimethyltryptamine or DMT. 
Mm -hmm. And it lasts a lot longer than a standard DMT, DMT trip would, which would be like 15 minutes, whereas ayahuasca lasts anywhere from four to eight hours-ish. Okay. And um, the, the whole dynamic surrounding ayahuasca is vastly different as well, because like you can just go into the desert or the woods with a couple buddies and some mushrooms and get a lot done. Mm -hmm. Ayahuasca, you're in a controlled setting. You know, this is... Uh, I keep keep in mind this is like through professionally provided uh, experience. So like Roger. it's not just you know being out the jungle, jungles trailer in the fucking swamp. Like <laughs> yeah. yeah, or that you know. And uh, you're at, you're in a you're at a retreat center with other veterans that also are there for the same reasons, and mm. you're with healers or you might call them shamans but they're technically called healers who have been doing this and training there they've had devoted their entire lives to being healers you mm -hmm. know these these people and they sing to you and uh everyone gets the same treatment from these healers and like again they've dedicated their lives to this they've gone alone into the woods for months at a time to eat just plants and understand the effects of those plants on their mind and their bodies and then you have two facilitators who are kind of like trip sitters or babysitters or whatever. It's kind of what they do more, so to speak. And, but the trip itself, when the medicine is what we call it, we call it the medicine, you know, because it's, that's what it is. This is not, we don't really try and refer to this as a drug or something, you know, lesser than what it is. This is strictly speaking a medicine. And yeah. when they, the overall effect is, I like to call it psychological surgery. Mm. Ayahuasca is going to go through your subconscious brain, your your whole terabyte of hard drive that you have living in your skull. And st so this is also over a three-night period. So technically, I've done ayahuasca six times. Okay. But um, on at two different retreats. And uh, But the first night's always like, a, a, they call it the handshake with the medicine. You meet this, you meet the medicine, you meet this, a lot of people do, I should say, not everyone does, but a lot of people do meet the medicine and it shows up as this female figure or entity. They call her Mother Ayahuasca or Grandmother Ayahuasca. And uh, you can communicate with this entity. And, but the, what what she will do and I say she because it's just kind of how everyone talks about it. The medicine refers to her as, you know, a she. And she goes through your subconscious and finds basically of like a virus scanning software to figure out where the problems lie. Where are the roadblocks for, for you as an individual? What are you stuck on? Why are you here? Mm -hmm. You know, and you're kind of just going through this and she's showing you where the problems are. And you go, wow, I had never realized that or whatever. Second night will be like the surgery, the work gets done and there's going to be for a lot of people a lot of puking a lot of crying a lot of yawning like if you're purging this negative shit that's mm -hmm. stored up in your subconscious and in your mind and your body and you're getting rid of it and you're throwing it up or you're crying it out or you're yawning or you're laughing or you're squirming and uh, it shows up differently for everybody whatever it needs we always say the medicine is what it needs to be because for each person it's always a different experience it might be similar mm -hmm. between people like very similar but there will be some key differences like for example the first time i went i had learned that through this virus scanning process that i had endured childhood sexual trauma when i was a teenager that my brain completely blocked out mm -hmm. like i had this feeling that th this happened but uh i got confirmation she was like straight up no this happened to you you know like, i'm sorry to tell you but this did happen and it was like in those words that's how i heard it yeah. in my brain and uh so like those are the kinds of things that like the virus scanning delivers to you it's just like hey you might have if you feel like you have you probably have gone through yeah. something similar to that and it's going to come up but it's okay that it comes up it's not a big deal in the sense that you, it helps you understand yourself better. You know, a lot of people, they don't want to visit these things because it scares them to understand that like, oh yeah, one time you were taken advantage of, you don't remember it, but it did happen. And now it's going to set the tone for how you're going to live the rest of your life. Because now you have this truth and this reality 
to face and deal with and kind of just uh, be aware of when it shows up in your life, you know, whether it's like whatever it is, you know, and it doesn't have to be that. It could be war trauma. It could be anything that someone's been through that scarred them because it, sh it will show up subconsciously in various areas of their life. And that's kind of what we realize and learn when we go down and do ayahuasca. It's like, okay, what parts of myself do I need to work on now that I know where they derive from? Mm -hmm. You know, and, um, but as far as visually, it's like, uh, everything glows, everything kind of like, looks like a, like a, one of those slow still camera shots. Mm. You know what I mean? Like the car trails, mm -hmm. the light trails and all that stuff. Like it kind of yep. looks like that. Um, you feel real tingly and like, uh, warm. If you, so there's a, there's another side to this too and it's like when they say you hear you talk about surrender to the medicine don't resist things like mm -hmm. that like typically what i have learned from my own, my own experiences when i am resisting it's really fucking difficult i can't sit still i'm really uncomfortable it's it it, it mentally it feels painful but it physically it isn't yeah um you know uh it feels like my body is squirming like i'm in pain but i'm not in pain you know what I mean? And uh, yeah. it's just like the way my cells are responding to it. But when I can breathe and just like relax and let them and finally accept that, like, you know, like, okay, fine. This body is yours. Dude, go ahead. You know, yeah. then it's much, it's much easier and it's much yeah. more enjoyable. No matter, even if you endure some sad, dark things that you would rather not see, like if you, as long as you can maintain relaxed, she will nurture you through it. The medicine yeah. will nurture you through it. But if you fight, she's going to fight. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. Like, it's like she's trying to hold you down the whole time. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting. You, you, the, the way you put that, too, is the fact that, you know, everybody has their own little things they do when they're under stress or when they're under, you know, and we, uh, my buddy Sean and I were talking about, <clears throat> you know, managing your tells and understanding uh, how to be authentic in a conversation and so on and so forth. Like when, uh, we had a great conversation on it, but it reminded me, my doc once said to me, she's like, you're the, you're the best, uh, client when you're under stress. And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, you giggle like a score girl when you get under stress. And I was like, what? <laughs> no, I don't. And as soon as, <laughs> as soon as she said it, I started realizing that, you know, when we start going into trauma work or, you know, some of the bad, bad memories that I have rattling around in my head. I would, I would talk about it and I'd be talking about these horrific things and I'd, and I'd be giggling like a schoolgirl, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't even recognize it until she pointed it out. And I was just like, uh, right. Okay. And now that I, now that I know that I can engage it and I can actually manage it and I can actually work with it. What, what is the work like when you're actually in the trip and you're, uh, you're saying on the second day when you start working, is it, almost like a physical process. Like I, what I'm picturing in my head is mentally like moving boxes around like, Oh, I got to take this and move it over here. And this has got to go over here. And this is, and it's like cleaning up your room kind of deal is yeah. something like that. Or what, what's the actual work like? It can be, uh, for some people it is like that for others. Like, like for me, it's always been just about real being maintaining relaxation and she mm -hmm. just kind of, the medicine will show me what I need to see. And, mm. um, it's weird. It's like when you're, I don't know if you've ever smoked weed, but like, if you've ever smoked oh, weed yeah. and like, uh, you have like, you'll be high and like watching something or doing whatever. Right. And then all of a sudden you realize you're high. Mm -hmm. You're like, when that happens, everything mm -hmm. kind of stops in the trip. You like, yeah. you kind of like have this awareness, like, oh shit, I'm on ayahuasca. And then like, everything just kind of gets like freezes. And then once you get out of that frame of mind again, it continues. <laughs> you know? uh, okay. And uh, so like, cool. that's the, that's the flow state though. That's the presence. And that's yeah. the, 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 the state you want to be in. And um, at least for me, that's what I've realized is just like, and that, and that is also something else that is synonymous with, you know, reality is maintaining a flow state is not noticing you're in a flow state. Right. Like that's yep. what flowing is. It's like you're in a state and you're focused on that thing and you're not thinking about yourself or anything else, just that thing. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah. There's a, there's those times. That's why they say, you know, it, uh, time flies when you're having fun or, yeah. Yeah. um, I don't, there were lots of rock marches where, 
you know, the just time just all of a sudden you're there and you're like, oh, okay, cool. And because you just fell into the ruck, you into the ruck step and you're just like, okay, and your body's moving. You're not really thinking, you just all of a sudden are there. Right. Uh, but when you do stop and go, oh man, my pack is heavy, then you're like, uh oh. Yeah. Now you're in You it. start yeah. noticing how much it sucks. And then you're like, man, yeah, exactly. it's worse now that I know it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or when someone points out how much it sucks and then you're like, man, yeah. like really? Yeah. Those are uh, cancerous, man. Oh, it's painful. It I like remember uh, I had this one particular uh, exercise we went on and it had been, we were in trenches and it was raining and crummy. We were out on the East coast and it was just, um, the training area is built in like a swamp because of course it is. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we were standing in trenches and we were soaking wet <clears throat> and we got told, Hey, we're going to do a class. So you guys got 20 minutes. And I was like, sweet 20 minutes. And I ran back to my pack and I ripped my boots off and I, powdered my feet like i made i was like we're going somewhere to do a class where i can chill for a bit i'm going to take care of my feet so that while they're we're doing the class awesome uh and i put on my gore-tex socks so that my feet would be dry by the time we got there and it was awesome uh and we walked from the trench line to where we're going to do the class and <laughs> i stepped like maybe six inches off the trail and i went all the way up to my hip into the <laughs> puddle or uh, wet spot i don't know what it is but i like dropped yeah. into it and all of a sudden my gore-tex sock was full of water and for the rest of the day because i didn't have time to change anything i had one wet sock the whole oh, day <laughs> it was just like water in it and uh there was a couple hours down the road where it didn't really like i hadn't really noticed it in a little while and a buddy of mine came up and he was like hey man how's your foot <laughs> i was like sucks a lot now thanks yeah. for, for reminding me yeah, um, i was trying to forget about it <laughs> yeah but so what the reason i brought up that story is that like there's a point beforehand where you're like you know i got this mm -hmm. and then you're dealing with a boatload of crap for a while and you get to a point where you're like okay i think i got this again <laughs> where it kind of yeah. you know i can i can work with under the situation we're in yeah and then you do it again and somebody comes up and says hey man how's your foot or you go on another ayahuasca trip and now you got more work to do right what's the how big of a difference did you notice between the first to the second in terms of like the actual work you were doing was it because what I, again what i'm imagining is like the first one was like you said surgery like you're you're uh you're trying to save a limb or you're like it's uh kind of like mash style surgery where they're just trying to stabilize right right yeah. and and then what i imagine is the next ones are more like fine-tuning and trying to get in and get a specific thing or is, is it like that or is like what's the uh, big difference between the two? so like it was described to me by the healers at my first retreat that the maloka you know, the temple where everything goes down is they call it the intensive care unit for the soul. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and it is that every time. And I think what happens in between retreats, if you're somebody that has been to one and wants to go to another or has been to multiple, what happens in between retreats is conditioning and, uh, habits and, uh, basically a distance occurs between yourself and reality and that all these habits and conditioning get in between that and kind of keep you or pull you away from what you learned from the last one mm -hmm. so going to another one and then a second retreat like for me was not as impactful as the first one because i'd already experienced it you know, I had I, I knew what ayahuasca more or less was going to be like mm -hmm. because I'd already felt it before. So you kind of have an expectation of what you're going to go through, but you won't. It's never <laughs> it's never what it turns out being. So mm. like for the second time, for example, I uh, for a long time, for many years now, I've struggled with my relationship with my parents. Um, 
without getting too deep into that, basically they were they're they're both just uh kind of emotionally and mentally immature people mm-hmm. and treated me as so. And yeah. they don't it's no and I've realized now because of this last retreat, like in in, in a way it's no fault of their own because they don't know any better. You mm-hmm. know, they've never done any inner work or had worked on self awareness or anything like that. So I can't knock them for it too much but for a long time i did i was very angry with them so this second night of my last retreat which was just in september i uh or october sorry and i uh i had to revisit all these memories i was holding on to painful memories from my childhood and stuff and go back and visualize and see child me you know seven eight nine ten eleven year old me and just kind of show myself some love and compassion and i would just like hug myself like this while i was in the medicine and just be like it's not your fault man mm-hmm. you know don't worry don't sweat it it's not your fault it's okay like they don't know what they're doing you know they're they're yeah. dealing with their own shit and they're putting it on you and it's not your fault and i had to do that and it was fucking exhausting like by the end of that night like i was just like bawling and just like exhausted and felt like shit and i realized to the listener that may sound can't sound counterproductive but you have to realize that like any good workout's going to make you kind of feel shitty afterwards right like any growth like i'm what I'm, we're, we're talking about with ayahuasca is like we're shedding the person that we have been to become someone else that's mm-hmm. not an easy process nope. we're we're trying to put take off armor that has now fused itself to our skin to protect us for what we thought would be an eternity. And we're having to take that off now and be armorless. You know, and it's painful and it's dirty and it's nasty and it's not fucking pretty. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, we need to understand that. That even if you don't do psychedelics, that's going to happen. And it, I, the way I look at it is psychedelics are kind of the, I don't want to say faster route for the, for the sake of sounding like it's easier, mm-hmm. but it definitely is uh the carpool lane you know what i mean (laughs) you know it's the it's the carpool lane and uh you know it's but that's that's why not many people go do this because not everybody can be in the carpool lane you know and you got to be able to move fast with it at the same time and that's what we call we always say like after the retreat is when the real work happens because now you have to go back to your reality away from this peaceful place in the middle of the jungle or on the beach or wherever you're at with these other great people who also also help peaceful. And you got to go back to this fucking hell of a civilization that you live in with all this chaos and pissed off people and all these things and try and maintain some sense of peace within yourself while all this is going on around you and not react to it. You know, like you got to go back and realize your parents are still the same people, even if you have healed some things. Like you're still going to be the same people. The friends that you have are still going to be the same people. The relationship you're in, it's just she or he is probably still going to be the same person. And if mm-hmm. you have to kind of make an assessment, and this is where the work is, is making these decisions for yourself that are better for you and not better for someone else necessarily. Or maybe for in some cases, you do need to make better decisions for the people in your life. Like maybe you need to loosen the reins and be more compassionate and understanding for the first people that you love in your life. Maybe you need to yeah. be more of that for yourself. You know, it's, it's, it's individually dependent, but that's what the work is. That's what we call the work. And that's the hard part, you know, like going yeah. there and drinking the medicine and sitting with people and throwing up while you're on a, in a psychedelic trip is relatively easy, you know, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you get what I'm saying. Oh yeah, for sure. It the uh, one of the biggest challenges in any type of growth. And actually, as you were talking about, you know, what it does, it reminded me of basic training. Basic yeah. training is not fun. It's not yeah. like it, but it's turning you into a different person because yeah. that civilian that uh, that signed up that got there is not the person that comes out the other side, yeah. right? And that that new person is going to do the same thing. He's going to set up all these tools around him and be like, Oh, okay, I can use that. And I can call upon that. And I can use these things and blah, blah, blah. And then you get out of the army and you start trying to apply those to an environment that does not accept those rules. Now you got to figure out a whole new thing. And I had a, a, a very similar relationship uh, with my dad. He and I, 
I, I had a lot of anger for him for many, many years, many, many years. And it wasn't until I realized something very similar of he's just, he's doing his best with the information he had. And, you know, I, I can't, any, any issues that I have with him or with the decisions he made in the time, I can't judge. I wasn't there. I don't know what he was going through. I can't see into his head. You know, he made some decisions. Cool. Yeah. Move on. I and and it's a lesson too, right? Like, yeah, it sucked for me as a kid not seeing my dad all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, I think there was a point where I didn't see him for like seven years or something like that. I didn't even hear from him; just disappeared. Um, but okay, cool. Yeah. Now that's a lesson for me. I got two boys. I am never going to do that. Yeah, dude. Right? And uh, there's there's something there too. Like what I've learned, especially in the special operations community, is like. The majority of us who go through special operations are guys that have a chip on their shoulder and something to prove. Yeah. And and that all, more often than not is always traced back to family shit. And what a lot of guys don't realize is the trauma, and this is not for everybody. I'm not trying to de- minimize anyone's experiences here, but a lot of the way trauma impacts us after the military has more to do with our upbringing than it does our military experiences because yep. of – the way that we are taught and learn how to interpret certain situations that may be otherwise deemed traumatic. Yeah. And, you know, what we watched our care, our, our caregivers do when we were growing up, how they responded to life and how they responded to unfortunate circumstances and traumatic things that happened to them. We will likely also repeat unless we know better mm-hmm. somehow, you know, some people yep. do, a lot of people don't, I didn't. And, uh, that was a lot of my struggles. I was responding to life the same way that they would, and it wasn't working for me. So yeah. I had to take a look at how I responded to life, and I noticed that they did this. They responded the same way to a lot of things. So I kind of had to rearrange the way that I looked at, and responded to all these situations. Yeah, yeah, that's a uh, that's a great point. Didn't, because or didn't respond or didn't you know respond. I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I tell my boys all the time. Right now, they're they're at an age they're. They're nine and five and they, uh, they're, they're still in that, you know, when I don't get what I want, they just kind of like, right. Yeah. Shut down. And I'm like, guys, you understand that this is a choice. You're choosing yeah. to shut down right now. <laughs> You're choosing to not do anything. You're choosing not to respond to me. And it, it's still, I'm still working on it, but all the tools that I've learned through my struggles and through my, you know, all the therapies I've done and the different stuff I've worked on, I'm passing them on to my boys. I'm mm-hmm. still trying, at least, <laughs> you know, and whether or not they pick that up, that's great. Um, but they get to see, you know, my my oldest, uh, he was born three months before I got out of the army or five mm-hmm. months before I got out of the army. So he grew up with me through like through my worst. And he has seen me change and grow and develop and so on to uh, to a point where I am now. But he doesn't remember any of that because he was a little kid. Right? <laughs> he was a baby for a lot of it. Um, but the benefit of this, at least, you know, in 10, 15 years, if he wants to take go, go back and look at it and he can go, oh, well, so he was developing. Oh, he was growing. Oh, that he is calling himself out on this. And he's da, 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 da. it's just such a great tool for not only for myself, but for men. How many dudes out yeah. there are going through the same thing and just struggling? and <laughs> Yeah. Making it That's harder, for. like you said earlier. And making it harder, right? Just yeah. making it harder. Oh, God. Uh, I just think of how many times I've heard somebody say, no, 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 I, I'll, I'll take care of it. I'll just do it myself. And you're like, but I'm here. I use this great analogy all, uh, a lot of times. Like, if you need to move a fridge, right? A fridge is, they're, they're heavy, but they're not ridiculous. Like, you can move them by yourself, yeah. right? And... I could probably walk one over to the truck and throw it down on the flatbed and like muscle it in there if I really need to. But how silly would you look if you had three of your friends there just watching you do this? Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, what'd you call me over here for? <laughs> yeah. Like, what, what are we doing here? Right. Yeah. And, uh, and it, and it's, it's big and it's heavy and it's awkward, but really you look like, a bit more of a fool doing it yourself that when you have people sitting there willing to help just sitting there going like, man, I can, I can show you the door. It's to just mm-hmm. do this, try this one thing for a little while, see if it works. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, it's challenging to watch sometimes, <laughs> but 
you also that's another little tidbit on that was that you can't i can't base my life on your healing yeah that's the other part of it and you want to help people right you always want to help people right. and you want to you know i want my brothers to be able to do what you know experience the good things that uh i've been able to experience but i, I say it all the time but like i could show you the door it's up to you to walk through it. it's up to you to do the work it's up to you to you know exactly. manage it yeah there's and speaking guys, of that oh go ahead there's guys i've been bugging to that i know would benefit from my ayahuasca retreat for a mm -hmm. long time now like probably a couple of years and they're just now like they before they're like nah bro that ain't for me but now they're like hey man uh how do i get down there <laughs> but yeah so, think you yeah, could hook really me good. up yeah, yeah exactly yeah that's awesome. Um, so, well, speaking of, of that, helping others and helping your friends, you, you're, uh, you're a coach as well, right? You're like, yes. like, so tell us about the combat coach and tell us all about how that works. How, if, if anybody wanted to actually find you and get a hold of you and, uh, work with you, how would they, how would they do that? Um, you just look up the combat coach on Instagram. My website is yep. the combat uh, and my email is Casey at the combat coach.net. But basically what I do, man, is uh, every Sunday – I just started this this year, by the way. Every Sunday at 4 Central Standard Time, I host group calls for veterans, basically just like what would in person be uh, you know, a group meeting where everyone just kind of shares what's going on. It's kind of open floor type deal. I even share what's going on for me, what I'm struggling with. You know, I'm not just a mediator, yeah. um, and those are free. You can go – to my Instagram, click on the link in the bio and take you right to whichever, because they're every Sunday at four, so whichever one you know you can make. If you want to go to all of them, that's fine too. They're free. doesn't cost anything. Uh, mm -hmm. Outside of that, I do one-on-one -on -one sessions with, with veterans and uh, on a more personal level, you know, like if they don't feel comfortable sharing whatever's going on in their life in front of everyone else, like they kind of, you know, I, I'm, I'm here to help in that arena. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I started doing that because I do – integration coaching for heroic hearts project to kind of help guys get ready for their trips to yeah. south america and help them interpret okay. what they uh went through while they were there so yeah. that's kind of where that all started for me but um and like i said i i I'm basically uh i'm on the edge of having my psychology degree you know so i'm i'm slightly educated it's not a phd or anything <laughs> but um i'm, edu I'm educated yeah enough to help you know on a mentorship level yeah and uh so yeah i mean that's what i do there um that's wicked yeah that's wicked i'm really i'm i'm, I'm glad to see this it's more and more often i'm seeing it is you know it, people looking back i got this great piece of advice i was on my uh doing basic mountain ops and <laughs> we, we climbed this uh this rock face and we got up to the top and um the instructor was there and he was like, okay, you've reached the top of, of the uh, the rope. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to turn around and you're going to put your hand out for the next person. And if they take it, great. If not, no big, then you just take up security, right? But each person just continually does that. And that first person puts their hand back, doesn't need it, cool, goes take security. Second guy, again, gets to the top, reaches back for the next guy. And I'm seeing it more and more and more in the communities we're all just like we're all searching for answers and more people more, yeah. more people are just looking back and going like look man here i can help that's a great like, that's a great analogy yeah. well thank you that's a perfect <laughs> analogy because it's like it does feel like that you know it's like even if it's not there always is going to be a mountain to climb i think yeah. like there's never not going to be and i think part of what we need to realize as people that are also veterans is that you know, self-awareness is a lifelong pursuit. Think of yourself as artificial intelligence becoming sentient. Yeah. You know, um, you up to up to this point, or whatever point it is for whatever person that decided, like, I'm gonna work on my self-awareness as an individual. From that point on, you decided to become sentient. You mm -hmm. decided to be to observe yourself, your thoughts and your emotions from a so to speak third-person point of view, and assist yourself in understanding that awareness so and that would happen until you know the day you're no longer here anymore yeah 
we're always going to be trying to understand ourselves. We're always going to be learning. We're always going to have something to heal. We're always going to, you know, and the, and the point is, and this is a hard one to do too, considering with the way the social climate is throughout the Western world right now, like nobody really wants to talk to each other, let alone see each other. Yep. But the only reason or the only way that we're going to get through anything is by, like you just said, sticking that hand out, you know, and like you said, they, maybe they'll take it, maybe they won't. But that's those for those of us have that have reached the point where we feel confident enough to look back and stick a hand out to help someone, at least to the point, same plateau that we're on, mm -hmm. do it, you know, like, yeah. And even if you're afraid of rejection, it's going to happen, you know, like no great thing ever happened to somebody who didn't put themselves out there. That's exactly it. And yeah. how many times were we told throughout uh, all of our training? Lead from the front. Lead by example. Be the person. Be the change you want to see. Be like, I don't know how many times we can hear that all over. Um, it actually kind of reminded me of when we were talking right at the beginning here. Uh, there's this saying that I got told, and I thought it was a joke. I put a post out about it a little while ago. But it was, um, the beatings will continue until morale improves. Right. And I don't know how many times I heard that. And it was always kind of like, ah, ah, ah they're just going to keep PT in, PT in us until we stop complaining. Mm -hmm. And then I heard it another way. And it was the lessons will be repeated until they are learned. And it was just like dawned on me. All the stupid things that I had done were just uh, icing on the cake that I had made for myself. Right. <laughs> just, and then I was, oh, right. Yeah. And what, um, there's another great line I saw it online just a little while ago. It was, um, we all have two lives, and the second one starts when you actually realize you only have one. Yeah. And it was like, yeah, it is. There's you get you get to a point where you're like, ah, oh. yeah, okay. As far as we know, this is the only chance we have. <laughs> this is it, right? Uh, yeah. Well, you know, we've been rolling for just over an hour here, brother. I, I can't thank you enough. It's been a great conversation. Um, before we uh we we wrap it up but i do have one more question is do you think ayahuasca and um mdma and you know all the the psychedelics do you think that they're they'd be effective for everyone or do you think that you need to really do you need to be at a like a low point or do you think at, even at a good point you go oh, i got some work to do and then go hit it do you think the... that would work for the for the relatively healthy individual, like somebody who doesn't deal with serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia and things like that, which I do mm -hmm. not recommend psychedelics for as it puts you in an alternative state of mind. Yeah. You know, being that they kind of more or less live in one, it wouldn't be, you know, <laughs> I don't think it would work very well now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, obviously that's very rare. But for the general person, the general veteran individual who is like at a point they have to one want to change. They have to, and they have to. And, they, and the reality is, is most people want to change, they just don't know how, right? Yeah. And psychedelics kind of show you how, so to speak, or at least afterwards, like you kind of go, oh wow, now I get it, you know. But they have to want it. They have to want to change. They have to want to feel better than they have been feeling, and they have to. There has to be a level of openness to that, like. You have to, it was, if uh, no one who doesn't want to risk losing who they think they are shouldn't do psychedelics. Mm -hmm. Because you, you have to be willing to drop the armor. You have to be willing to drop the persona, the posturing, all that shit, that tough guy bullshit. Like, you have to be willing to drop it. You have to be willing to mm -hmm. put it aside. Or otherwise, you're just going to fight the whole time. And the only thing you're going to get out of it is uh, next time, don't fight. You know, yep. <laughs> more or less. Um, <laughs> or or this happens a lot, too, to guys who have, uh, we call them difficult experiences rather than bad trips. But if they have a difficult experience, a lot of times they will find a greater appreciation for life because they thought they were going to die the whole time. Mm. <laughs> You know, that does happen too. I know people. Yep. that's happened to me on mushrooms. Like I've had a bad experience. And yeah. the, when it was over, it was weird because it ended just like that. Like I was out of the trip all of a sudden. And I just, it was so tough and and scary that I just fell on the ground in the middle of the desert and started bawling. Like, thank God. 
<laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. It's like but, an index, right? Just but I, yeah, and just, even as much as it sucked, I still got that out of it. Just like, okay, yeah. one, I flew too close to the stun. For yeah. One, and I need to. I need. And that's when I was like, I was doing mushroom trips like back to back, all like every two weeks. Mm. I was doing a big dose, and I think that time they were like, stop for a while, you know. <laughs> So I was like, all right, I'm done for a while. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's awesome, man. I I yeah. I'm actually I'm I'm quite interested in it too because I'm pretty I'm pretty comfortable where I'm at, yeah. right? I I feel pretty confident where I'm at, and because I'm comfortable and because I'm confident, I'm like, me, I need to push the boundaries a little bit <laughs> and just get yeah, maybe I, because I I I'm, I'm always looking for the growth corridor. Yeah. What's yeah. the next thing I I want to I want to learn I want to build I want to like I just want to keep doing stuff. What I learned to control after a little while was the fact that it's not that I I used to do that because I wanted to be busy so that I didn't deal with everything else. But now I'm finding that the more I learn about myself and the more that I have I gain insight and the more I learn in the sequence of you know betterment and growth and all these things. I'm intrigued by more. I'm fascinated by more. And I don't want to dive deeper into it. And I want to see what's next. And I want to, and you know, with the podcast, this is I just pass them on to somebody else. Right? <laughs> Cause if I, yeah. if I try them and I'm like, Hey, this isn't for me. Cool. But that guy might be able to use it. Yeah. Uh, all the more. I better. think it's, I think it's for any, it's, for, I, I would say mushrooms definitely at least are for the curious individual, mm -hmm. you know, a person who's has a, can be open to the experience. Cause that's really all you need, you know, some shit might show up that you've been ignoring or neglecting and you kind of mm -hmm. may have to face that reality. But, uh, you know, like I, it's, that makes that it's, we, we, that makes us sound negative or like, it's going to be scary, but it's not always scary. You might just go, Oh shit. All right. I guess I got something to work on now. And that mm -hmm. could be the end of it. It doesn't have to be this big, you know, theatrical fucking thing. <laughs> it can just be something really simple, you know? <laughs> Yeah. 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 I also want to a... say too, I wanted to mention too before we get off here, um, Heroic Hearts Project is now expanding to Canada. And I know we meant I mentioned this on the group call I had with all the Canadian mm -hmm. veterans. So we do have a Canadian branch now and we will be assisting Canadian veterans in having the ayahuasca experience. Outstanding. So. Outstanding. I know a few guys that uh would really benefit from that who are they're they're in periods where they they, they could really use that. <laughs> they could really yeah. use that help. Yeah. Um, I'll actually, I'll put you in touch with one of the guys that I think might, uh, might be interested in it right away. So we'll see where, cool. is it, yeah. is it out of anywhere specific or does it matter? Uh, I, as far as I know, it doesn't matter, but I okay. just know we have, we have a UK branch, a United, a US branch, and now we just started a Canada one. So sweet. Awesome. Well, we'll, uh, make, I'll get the information from you and I'll make sure it's in the show notes. So if anybody wants to reach out, they can reach out to you directly or reach out to the the organization or whatever the Sounds good. process is. Yeah. But uh, again, can't thank you enough for being on here, brothers. This Dude, it's <laughs> awesome. all on this Great side. Thank you so much. It's absolutely my pleasure. We'll, uh, we'll chat with you soon. Very, I guess in the next little while with everything else going on. And uh, I, I'm going to, I got another thing I'm doing called the collective, which mm -hmm. I will, uh, I'll get you involved in with as well. Cause it's, it's just me uh, right now. It's basically, the group of us created this thing that we want to um, rebuild the community. Basically, mm -hmm. that's all it, it. And we're realizing that hey, at, this is kind of the community now, and that technology yeah. is something that we need to utilize, and not shy away from. Or like, I don't want to be on Instagram. I'm like, this is it. <laughs> like, this is sure. the new legion. This is the new meetup place. This is the new hangout. This like online is the way to the way to go. So I'll, we'll get you involved with that too. And uh, yeah, also, those take... group calls are open to Canadian veterans too. Like, oh, sweet, yeah. Anyone who can speak English can go. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I would say I don't say that in a in a derogatory way, but just because everyone speaks English, <laughs> so we could actually yeah. you know be helpful I mean? to yeah. understand what people are saying. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. We'll get the we'll get all the info for that, and I'll put it again, put it in the show notes, so that we're cool. we're good to go. It'll be awesome. And. Uh, don't go anywhere. I'm just going to end the recording, but uh, All right, gotcha. I, really, I really appreciate you being on here, man. We'll talk to you later. Awesome. Thanks. That concludes another episode of the toolbox. I really appreciate y'all listening. It has been my absolute pleasure bringing you this guest. 
If you enjoyed what you heard, please like, share, subscribe, do all that other wicked stuff. It uh, helps me keep the lights on. To all those out there putting it on the line every day, I just want to let you know that I appreciate you. Military, veterans, first responders, civil servants, you name it, keep this place running and I really do appreciate it. So thank you. Don't forget, stay open, stay humble, stay focused with grace, not slack. Gmo.